Good afternoon and welcome to another one of our afternoon security seminars. In the past few weeks we have heard presentations on various forms of behavior that we'd like to block, on some theoretical foundations for security mechanisms, on, se on security mechanisms that can be employed in distributed systems, on intrusion detection and response capabilities, but what happens if we get to the point where all of those have been tried and a system is still affected? Then we need to investigate. We need to apply forensic techniques to discover what's happened to the system and to attempt to recover and to trace back to the perpetrator. This is a field that is relatively new in that there are not a great number of people working in it and computing technology changes rapidly. However, there are some people who have been participating and uh, working in this realm for a number of years. We're very pleased today to have with us speaking Jim Hansen of Trident Data Systems. He has nearly a dozen years experience in tracking down computer intruders and employing forensic techniques on computer systems. Eleven of those years have been spent at the Air Force Office of Special Investigations where he eventually arose to the position of Deputy Director for Forensic Investigations. So please join me in welcoming Jim Hansen as he talks to us about computer forensics. Thank you, Dr. Spafford. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me out here. Um, I'll try to live up to the introduction. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of a, a roundabout uh, view of consulting, especially from, from a computer forensics incident response side of the house. It is definitely a tailored presentation to fit what happens when things go wrong. I've got the one obligatory what the heck company do I work for slide in there, so we'll get through that as fast as possible. Uh, probably run over some techniques and methodologies that we're currently using. Uh, to assess systems after they've been hit, uh, help companies straight down litigation issues with electronic evidence. And then uh, I'll go through some very, very sanitized case studies. I apologize that they're heavily sanitized, but my clients would beat me if I gave out true names and true incidents and stuff like that. The essential details are there, um, but they've been sanitized enough that uh, they won't be able to be attributed back to the client. Nonetheless, what I'm going to provide you today is a fairly in-depth look at how we do business in a commercial forensics consulting environment. So a lot of the information in here is essentially Trident uh, proprietary or, or copyright notice, so I just wanted to pass that to you. Most important, please, uh, the details of the incidents. In general terms, it's great to talk about, and I'll glad to answer any questions, but uh, anything specific about them, I'd prefer if you keep that fairly low-key and uh, quiet. So I appreciate that very much. Okay, I think I ran over most of that already. As I was introduced, I've got uh, a few years of experience mostly with the government, with the military side of the house as an investigator. Started out, went to school, got a bachelor's degree in computer science, and went into the Air Force. Thought I could fly planes. They helped me realize that probably was not going to work real well. Um, apparently landing is important. Ah, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't do real well in that phase. They were kind enough to allow me the opportunity to, uh, to join their investigative arm. The Air Force has a very small investigative arm, about 1,200 people. They do essentially the same felony level investigations that the FBI would do or the Secret Service would do. Uh, actually set up by a former uh, deputy director of the FBI under Hoover uh, back in the 40s. Great organization. Um, but it was the military. So with a computer degree, they sent me out and uh, my first set of assignments was to run economic crime cases, white collar fraud cases. Computer degree, not an accounting degree, but that's okay. We figured that stuff out. Um, second assignment was to do a lot of counter narcotics work. So they sent me for about three years with a ponytail buying coke for the government. Um, and then finally worked my way back onto the technical team with computer crime. Started out doing forensic examinations and then ended up working primarily on internet intrusion cases. Helping out uh, when DOD or Air Force systems were penetrated, uh, identify who did it, and then uh, basically track them back and introduce them to those, uh, those magic charm bracelets and the, uh, the court system, if possible. So that's kind of my background. I definitely am going to pitch you from that side of the house, from an investigator in the trenches viewpoint. A lot of what we do in computer forensics consulting right now is based on, on two sides of the house. The technical side is very, very important. But You've got to be able to follow up and understand what the technology gives you for a lead and figure out how to exploit that information for an investigation. Um, so I'll try to give you a rundown on how that goes. We are doing some stuff with the non-Microsoft based operating uh, system, so I don't know if that's politically appropriate to say or not, but that's the direction we're heading. I uh, will pre-declare I am not a Linux guru or propeller head whatsoever. I do what the guys in the lab tell me to do, um, and that's the direction they're going. But they've outlined it and they've used small words, so I should be able to get through it fairly well. 
The one uh, obligatory company slide, uh, Trident is basically a privately held firm. Uh, it was just recently acquired by a larger conglomerate called Viridian, which does essentially about 80% government consulting, 20% commercial consulting. I am firmly entrenched in the commercial side of the house, although occasionally I'll help out some government clients. Um, Corporate headquarters uh, is basically outside of D.C. We've got about a thousand folks in the company. About 850 of them are cleared uh, to very high levels for classified information. Um, the one thing that, that helped me when I was leaving the government and decided to go out and, and uh, work in a commercial environment, I was looking at places to go and there was a lot of interest in the reactive side of the house, forensics, incident response. And I picked Trident for a couple of reasons. I liked it. I worked with their folks. They're down at the AFCERT and a few other places in the Air Force, the, the Air Force's Computer Emergency Response Team. I liked them. I also knew that uh, if I went into the company, there were these phenomenally great technical resources. You know, switch gurus on bizarre makes of switches, folks that can handle mainframes that, that I wouldn't dare touch on my own. So there were a great pool of technical resources to work with. So that's why I ended up there. Uh, definitely was my first choice to go to, and uh, I've had a blast there for the past year and a half. The company itself is primarily focused on the positive side of information uh, security, protective work, uh, secure network operations, assessments, penetration testing, that type of stuff. Our forensics business accounts for less than 10% of, uh, of a corporate revenues or, or corporate share, um, and that's been over about the past year and a half that I've built that up. So we're getting there. Uh, primary clients on the government side are the Department of Defense. We do a lot of work at their computer forensics laboratory outside of DC. And then on the commercial side, it's interesting, our client base can be a huge multinational conglomerate and a two-person organization that just got hacked. So it spreads a lot of areas. It keeps it real fresh and real interesting, kind of fun. Okay, that was the obligatory blur. Let's talk about what is computer forensics. Now, this is sort of the consulting definition. Um, essentially, they're real thorough, documented examinations of systems. Any storage media that's there, anything that would record data that may be pertinent, that it may essentially be evidence. Um, it's got to be obviously of interest to the client. If you find evidence that they don't care about, that's not a great thing. Um, and it may provide investigative leads or investigative actions for a law enforcement agency, a private investigative firm, or something like that. Number one thing, these examinations go well beyond just casual finger hacking on a system. Um, it's not that the technology is all that difficult, it's actually it's the procedures used so you can get what you did into court and get a jury to start to look at you and not completely fall asleep. That's the important part. Um, so that's why it's so tightly controlled. So I guess that's sort of the uh, technical definition. Um, we have a lot of fun going in with clients after they've had some folks, good IS folks, good network managers, maybe not coming from a security background, have an incident and go in and start pounding around on keyboards on systems where the original evidence is. That is generally what we call a bad thing. Um, so we like to stress that this is not a good thing to do a forensic examination for an untrained person. The chance of, of destroying or, or eliminating some of the evidence is fairly high. But not only that, they're in for a real fun time when the defense or the other side decides to cross-examine them in court. There's nothing better than a really good attorney torturing you for three or four hours on the stand. It's kind of fun. Um, I guess that was the, the official definition. Uh, our, our real consulting uh, definition is, number one, it always comes in on your day off or after normal work hours, anywhere from 4 p.m. to midnight, absolutely positively guaranteed. It will come in on the cell phone and the pager, generally at once, because um, the person has about four or five people calling you. It's a client. It's, it's the Houston, we have a problem call. Um, something really, really bad happened. We're not really quite sure what, um, but we know it's bad. We've either lost money, somebody's stolen something from us, something along those lines. Um, we want you to tell me exactly what happened, we want you to recommend how to fix it. I would like the report yesterday. Um, tomorrow is probably too late. And can you get to Texas, Alaska, Mexico, wherever tonight? And just as a side note, we probably will end up either terminating the person if they're an internal employee or suing them until the end of time if possible. So you will have to tell a judge. And the other attorney is going to try to make you look like a goofball as best as possible. So that's what it's really all about. Uh, it's, it's time crunch. It's get in there and help the client out. They're usually in a very, very serious position. Um, to give you a kind of a rough ballpark on numbers, uh, we do a lot of work for uh, banks, international banks, U.S. banks. A couple of incidents. The first one that we've had uh, one major financial that we worked with. 
their first incident cost them, no kidding, about $10 million in lost revenues. So we're talking some fairly good change. So they're, they're a little bit agitated and irritated. Um, a two-person office that uh, is literally right around the corner from my office that called us for help, they, uh, they were essentially taken off the net and their server was trashed. So they were out of business for about a week and a half because, of course, they had poor backup procedures. Um, so usually they're in a world of hurt when they call um, and they want you in there as fast as you can get in there. That's uh, the beauty of red-eye flights. What happens? What's the environment like? Um, scarily, actually, we're seeing about 30% of the time that we get called, it is theft of intellectual property. Uh, pharmaceutical companies that have folks that are leaving with development materials, financial institutions with folks that are leaving with strategic plans, merger and acquisition data, consulting houses that have lost intellectual property on how they do business. So it's pretty good stuff. That, uh, that's an interesting and evolving area of the law, um, the intellectual property and, and the misuse of it, particularly with electronic evidence. Even more spooky, 20% of them are internal sabotage, mostly in the financial industry where we find those. Uh, employees loading on or cooperating and loading on malicious code that will nuke anything from workstations all the way up to servers that control money movements. Um, so that's a bad thing, generally. I don't do a whole lot of electronic home banking, let me put it that way. And I still print out everything from Quicken on a regular basis because I figure, worst case, you know, the house burns down, at least the files may come through semi-charred. Um, like the electronic stuff better, but good to have a paper copy. The, the big majority of it is employee misconduct and really um, clients don't call us for that originally. It's kind of strange. Um, one of the things that we do now when we go into a client environment and they've lost some intellectual property, somebody's hacked them or something like that, we, we explain to them in general how forensics works, that we're going to look at systems at a fairly detailed level, fairly comprehensive level. Along the way, we're going to be able to do something fairly simple called identify image files on the system, whether they're actually there, deleted fragments, if they're in Slack or in free space. One of the things we like to ask is, do you have a policy about certain materials being on your systems? You'd be amazed to find out how many companies have policies against surfing uh, the web for adult materials, and then we will go through and do 12 drives, and seven of them will have stuff that will will actually make you kind of sick. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we're seeing is actually it's a corollary. We're in there looking for somebody that hacked, somebody that stole something, and along the way you find you know four and a half gigs of porn somewhere, um, some of which is pretty gross. That usually uh, helps the clients do some cost recovery there in terms of salaries. Um, <laughs> yeah, kind of spooky. Uh, we actually have we have a kind of a, a, a a procedure, an internal procedure for when we discover child pornography. You know, depending on what your opinion is of pornography, there are some, some actual laws on the books when it comes to child pornography that possession of three images is essentially a felony level at the federal level. So that's pretty serious stuff. We actually found that in one of our investigations. Now, the examiners and I are not trained medical doctors, so we're not able to specifically testify that this is guaranteed 100% a juvenile under the age of 18. But the, the kind of windage test in there said, you know, there's about 20 of these images, and we're fairly sure three of them at least probably don't look good. We built a procedure where we immediately call the client and immediately strongly recommend to them that they contact local law enforcement in that area. Um, we preserve that material, we preserve all of our records, we seal it, get it to the client, we get it out of our environment as fast as we possibly can. But that's actually spooky that we found it um, in, a, in a very professional organization, so kind of spooky. Another thing that's scary to me is that the client rarely has any procedures whatsoever for dealing with incidents or dealing with computer forensic evidence. Um, they generally do not have a lot of in-house expertise. We've worked with a few companies that are starting to develop it. Uh, a lot of the larger financial institutions are developing not only certs, but forensic response teams. Um, and that's an encouraging sign. They're actually pushing employee awareness out to modifying training programs so that employees realize if they see something weird on the system or the network that the best answer may not be to investigate it on your own but call for help, call for backup. Um, so that's an encouraging sign but it has definitely not hit widespread market acceptance. Half the time, the client has already served papers, they're into some civil suit, and they just realized, hey, you know what? The four pieces of paper we've got are cool, but this guy had like two notebooks and a desktop. There's probably something on there. We should look. Um, so they're already looking at time constraints uh, to get material into court. And like I said, uh, clients range from international banks all the way down to small high-tech firms. Uh, average client is probably on the higher end of that. You know, multi-hundred million to billion dollar firm would be kind of the average client size. A few smaller ones. So that's kind of the nature and the environment that we're in. Systems-wise, uh, what we're looking at 
currently, and this is based on about the past 20 engagements, so a rough windage estimate here. Um, 95, 98 boxes are, are about 40% of the boxes that we're looking at. Presents no significant challenge for a forensics examination. Uh, NT boxes, about 23% of the time. Uh, workstations or servers, uh, depends on, on what you want. Depending on what country we're in, some legacy Windows 3X stuff that's still laying around, some uh, kind of vanilla DOS stuff. Unix boxes of every shape, flavor, and format. Um, Linux, Solaris, depends on what you're into. Uh, mainframes, generally Stratus, Trant, Tandems, and any version of IBM. Uh, and uh, scary enough, still some Novell boxes out there, old Novell, um, that is not TCP IP based. We'll, during our data gathering phase, we'll also grab anything we can get a hold of that may be pertinent from an electronic evidence standpoint. We'll get copies of logs, system files, any corollary boundary protection devices, intrusion detection devices, dial-in modem pool records, telephone logs, anything we can get our hands on to try to shape the incident if it appears pertinent. So there's a lot of blending of data there for the final report. All right, that's generally the environment that I work in. Um, it involves excellent frequent flyer miles on the airline of your choice, um, late hours, uh, sneaking into places as a Y2K hardware assessor to actually covertly clone drives. So it's kind of fun. It's, you know, it's good cop kind of stuff, um, but it does definitely have a technical bent. We've got a process for doing it, and that's the part I want to outline. Uh, it, and by the way, if you do have any questions while I'm talking, feel free to throw something not too terribly hard at me, uh, slow me down, and uh, we can take your questions at any time. The first phase of it is very, very important, and you have to do these sort of in sequence, and you have to sort of do the preceding phase right, or the next one's not going to really help you a whole lot. And number one is, is the big one. You've got to get the media, and you've got to make sure that you can verify its integrity. And that's important because the basis of being able to present this material in a court of law, if required, is your integrity, your procedures, your, your verification of the integrity of the data on the system. U.S. laws are actually pretty easy to work with. I did a case, uh, the now somewhat infamous Rome Labs case. I ended up on the cleanup squad doing a lot of the follow-up leads and uh, actually presented in London at Bow Street uh, Magistrates Court. It's kind of cool. I mean, the whole thing with the wigs and stuff and standing in the box, it's kind of actually like up here, um, except everybody had little white powdered wigs on. But very tough, stringent level of evidence admissibility based on their Computer Crime and Security Acts and their Data Preservation Acts, the prosecution was coming in with reams and boxes of paper, of printouts. That was the way it was going to work for all the logs from all the sites that we assessed that were hit. And that was their level of acceptability for computer evidence was it's on paper, it's signed by the agent or the investigator that printed it. So here in the U.S. we're not quite that difficult. Some attorneys sometimes can read CD-ROMs that have HTML stuff on them. Um, some courts sometimes will accept computer-based evidence depends. Uh, sometimes a jury will even follow where you're going. Um, so it works out pretty well. Next step is do as much as you can, much of the parsing as you can in an automated fashion. Um, if with try sizes today, you know, you can get a 20 gig drive for a fairly reasonable price on an IDE drive. That's a lot of bits to look at with a hex editor page by page. That's, um, it, if it were time and materials engagement and the client would pay you, yeah, it'd be great to work till you're 90 on one gig, but uh, most folks do not want to wait that long. So scan what you can with automated tools. Then generally you'll have to go through a process of restoring the media um, and doing logical searches. The automated searches we do are generally physical level, uh, raw dump data, uh, looking for keywords, carving out images. You almost always will get into a logical environment, date time stamping type issues, how the file was used, where it was, where it was in the system, that type of stuff. Then as we step down these kind of six levels, each one is progressively more painful in terms of the time investment. Um, phase one, we can get in and out of an office. Um, I think we did uh, uh, the time we pretended to be Y2K solution providers um, with the client's concurrence, but not the office that we were going into's concurrence. Um, we went in and went out with 12 drives completely cloned in about 10 hours. So we got in there about 4 p.m. and snuck out somewhere in the early dark morning hours. Um, so that's pretty quick. The rest of these stages get progressively more difficult. If you get down to doing manual data review and time stamping, looking at every file or every data file you think is important, as you folks would know, that uh, can take you a long time. Uh, and then trying to parse all the data together, take your firewall logs, your, tone, uh, your toll logs from your phones and everything, jumble that together with system date time stamping, it can take a long time. Um, Clients don't like that part, which is why we work a lot of late hours um, or early mornings, depending on how you look at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, first step, the first big step, you've got to get the data. Uh, generally a hard drive, um, floppy disks, CD-ROMs, DVDs, um, any type of recordable media. 
We also, if we're actually helping the client look in an office um, for an employee issue, let's say somebody left with uh, proprietary data and we go in and take a look at their office, never hurts to actually look under the paper, under the keyboard for passwords obviously, um, sticky notes, books that are on the shelf, give you an idea of their inclination, their technical level of knowledge, anything like that, any notes that they may have laid out anywhere that are helpful. So uh, just kind of take a good nose around and then get on the electronic media. If you can't get the media out of the system that it's in, which is the preferred route, we'll do a controlled startup of the system uh, with a boot disk or some other version of a controlled startup to get access to the magnetic media. By far, the preferred step is whip that hard drive out of there, grab all the floppy CD-ROMs and cut and run for the lab. But sometimes some clients do not allow you the opportunity. Or if you're dealing with a system that is very, very big, that you know this uh, would not probably work, a Stratus mainframe or something like that, and you work on a, lar a live system, you generally will involve system administrator, the network manager, whoever's there to work on the system with you. Um, the idea is, and the main goal is, for any system that's going to have primary evidence, is you want a physical bit-by-bit -bit copy from the beginning track all the way back to the back end, every last bit of it. Um, you want to clone that off. There are a variety of tools, we're developing a new one, um, to do that in different operating systems. Uh, you'll verify all the copies are accurate, uh, some MD5 work basically, uh, report, record the checksums. Everything you do, uh, do a step write a step down and then you get your banana is basically it. You know, if you don't record it, you're done in court. Uh, generally our logs are date time stamp. We got into the building at this time. We started in this guy's office at this time. We popped the case on the box. It was one of these. It's, it's kind of somewhat monotonous. Um, we're still doing it in pen and paper for the logs, mainly because most of the clients like it that way. We all use Palm Pilots. We'd prefer to go that route, but uh, most of them want to see a handwritten hard copy log of that type of data. Um, once we get the images, we want to preserve them. Assuming that the procedure worked out well, you've copied the drive, you've got the checksums and everything else, keeping them on another hard drive is not necessarily a good answer because somebody from the other side is going to say, well, you went in there and fiddled with the hard drive and you messed it up. So we'll burn copies of the images in chunks off to CD-ROM right off the bat. As DVD burners become lower in price and clients have more DVDs, we'll move to DVD because it's just a drive space issue. Um, it still can take a lot of CD-ROMs to do a 12 drive case now uh, to push all that. And we provide that as part of our report to the client also, the actual uh, electronic images of the hard drives. We follow basically uh, access controls and chain of custody procedures that are would be very familiar to anyone in the FBI or OSI or any other investigative agency. It's hand to hand or registered mail or FedEx, all annotated and documented, date, time, who's got what. When we get back to the lab, our lab is within three layers of physical barriers, um, cipher locks, alarms, and then the data is actually stored in a safe that's approved for up to top secret. So it's, it's fairly good protection. I'm comfortable with that. I don't think there's a high likelihood of anybody snaking into the lab and stealing the data. Um, be very impressed if they pulled it off. You've got your copy. You're fairly comfortable that it works. Second step is to frisk it as fast as you possibly can and get whatever leads you want. Because you remember the client's somewhat probably irritated, somewhat concerned, and you're about 12 to 14 hours into the engagement and they want an answer now. Um, we'll do some tuning with the client. Okay, if this is your pharmaceutical development product, what's the name of the pills you're making? What's the marketing name? What are some chemical names? Give me some stuff that is discrete identifiers that may identify documents, records, emails. Emails especially, as Microsoft case is proving real interesting stuff in litigation. Um, give me some indicators that I can look for on this 20 gig drive and we'll spool the search string up with that and we'll go for it for a physical level search which is a great way to spool out results. Generally on a 20 gig drive you're going to get anywhere from 55 to 100 plus megs of data back. We've got some parsing tools that we use after that to kind of shake and sort what looks like it might really fit so that generally you're down to under a meg of hands-on taking a look at raw results. Um, take a look at that and kind of get some pointers. If you've got any obvious no-brainers, hey your case is is proven. Here's the letter that says, yeah, I work for the Russian mafia. I'm sending it to whoever here at this place. You know, we can stop then generally if the client wants us to. That's usually good enough for them to press forward. Um, only had one case that worked out so far that way. Um, so that, that doesn't happen a whole lot. Uh, the list has got to be brief. You know, somebody gives you a list of six gazillion keywords, then they're not really keywords. They're just a lot of words on a drive. Um, and you try to narrow things down that will not be included in the operating system or common small English language words are going to be included all over the place. Uh, first step, 
get as many systems. Uh, we basically run eight systems in the lab for uh, basically four systems per examiner that we will zoom through as many of the drives as we can simultaneously, kind of dump our results out to a server to look through them. We'll shove them up into a database and start playing, hey, what's this look like games? Um, get some pointers. That's where the interface between technology and investigation really comes in because there you've got, okay, this is a hacking case. You're going to know from your background, from history, from reading, from whatever, generally these kind of things you might want to look for. And if you see some of these, these are red flags, holy smokes. Um, and a theft of intellectual property case, transmission documents are what you're looking for. Something that shows that the person emailed the data out. Those are great. We just found some of those last week. Um, those you live for. Those are phenomenally good data. That's the kind of stuff that you want to look for. And then you work down your, okay, we didn't find the really hot stuff, so now we're working down on bits and pieces, fragments of email, whatever. Um, can go quick if you're lucky and it definitely provides the basis for the rest of your examination. Step three in it, um, that's when you get into the logical level and it gets a little bit more time and consuming. Uh, we'll shove the image copy back across onto another drive. We'll boot the system as close as we can. If we have the original system, we'll boot the copy inside the original system, particularly uh, on an Intel side of the house. Uh, makes life a lot easier uh, with Windows not freaking out, finding new hardware, new versions of hardware on the way up. Um, we'll go ahead and as opposed to doing physical level searches, we'll search for relevance. We'll look for data in the actual logical existent file structure. We'll look in the free space, which is kind of a no-brainer. But then we'll also have some tools that will pull f uh, the slack space, the dead space at the end of the file area. Um, that stuff's great because that is generally your evidence that an average user is not going to be aware exists. Most users are smart enough to delete files. Four out of ten are smart enough to use PGP and wipe them. Um, but a lot of the users out there, if they don't delete it, they think it's good enough, or if they delete it, they think that's good enough, pardon me. But they have no idea that once you delete it and leave it laying there on the, on the hard drive, that what you're doing is praying for an overwrite to eliminate the data. So that slack space that's out there usually has all the goodies. Anybody that's using PGP, then you get into a whole different game with physical level um, magnetic recovery type stuff, and we generally do not do that. Um, there are a few companies out there that do, and uh, primarily the purview of, of uh, law enforcement and the intelligence community. You'll look through, try to refine your keyword list. Uh, you've shaken it out in the first level. Obviously, we're at level two, so we didn't find the smoking gun already. Uh, you'll try to narrow it down as best you possibly can. Look for the real gems in there. Uh, run search tools against the logical files. First come in every po way possible. Sometimes we'll even grab all the free space from all the drives and all the cases and just do raw free space analysis. It is more accurate in terms of it gives you placement. The physical search is accurate in terms of getting you the data, but this gives you placement. Is it in a Word document? Where is it at in the, in the directory structure? What are you looking at? So it gives you some association on how the client works. Um, for example, one, uh, one client who had a uh, senior VP that did their strategy and marketing left to be a, a CEO of a uh, competing firm. And uh, the results of what he was taking, he stored in a folder called results. And it also was his job offer letter that he got emailed to him stored there. So it just gives you an idea of the, of the person that you're dealing with that did whatever happened on the system. It can help. Um, less automated, more labor intensive. I think I pounded that to death. Manual investigation and time stamping. Uh, the big ugly world. Um, what types of files, what types of systems are they using? What are they doing when they use this computer? Um, do an analysis on deleted files. If you're using Norton, the various categories of deleted files, they're easily recoverable all the way down to their funk and we can't get to them. What is a normal profile for a user for that? Does this user appear to have deleted everything on the planet two days before we came in the door? Uh, looking at kind of the issues associated with who's trying to cover their tracks essentially. If it's an uh, email case, a spreadsheet case, something where data is going out the door, you look at every single one of them um, and you do that by carving out the headers physically and then identifying the files backwards and going after them because it's easy to rename things as we all know. Um, do time stamping based on, on date modified, date created. Those can be important dates depending on what other information the client has given you. Um, like I said, we're working on a copy now, so we're comfortable making changes to this data because we're only working on the copy and we have the image preserved in the safe. Uh, so we'll let it boot up, um, see what happens to the system. Is there something weird going on? Um, is there something loaded that could be kind of fun or ugly? Uh, very, very labor intensive. And you really want to focus your effort based on your prior results. Um, link analysis. This is where you take everything else you've got from off system logs, interviews, um, a good example of this. Uh, another, uh, the bank case that was about $10 million. Uh, they, ha uh, they were hacked. 
they lost the ability to process electronic transactions up to 10 separate times, um, which caused clients of theirs to leave to more reliable banks. Also, uh, it was in a foreign country. Uh, they had two ATMs vandalized. One was actually burned and one was beaten with an ax. Um, so they suffered physical damage loss also. Um, yeah. I get mad at ATMs, but I don't get ax mad at them. But I, I don't know. Um, went through, their system auditing procedures were terrible. Um, we knew that it had happened to the tandem machine. We knew it came from inside the network because we'd frisked all the tile-up logs. We'd frisked everything on the, on, the, uh, on the firewalls. Found nothing. Came up with a list of likely suspects, folks that were either torqued off and technically savvy. Folks that could operate in a tandem environment, that could get to the box and deal with it. Their internal controls, by the way, stunk. There were next to no logs on the, on the uh, tandem, and what were there were overwritten like every half an hour or hour or something, saving a little disk space, I guess. Nothing. I mean, we found, we found stuff that said, yeah, these three or four folks, they kind of smell like there might be something awry here, but nothing, certainly no smoking gun. Old investigative skills come together. It was great. They had an um, automated entry system with infrared slap badges that were uniquely identified to every employee. <laughs> I pulled 44,000 of those records out and sat there with a spreadsheet and uh, some, some fun afternoons frisking through all those records looking for patterns. Found a guy, uh, one of the 10 primary suspects, that was in, their, in the facility, in the computer facility, 9 out of 10 occasions when it happened. And on the 10th occasion, he left 3 minutes before the event happened. So I'll write that to system clock issues. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with that. The next highest competitor was there 30% of the time. That's pretty good enough, I think, for an employee termination issue. Then we went back um, and uh, took a look at his drive and found some interesting stuff in his, uh, in his email um, that was the stuff that kind of made us think he maybe smelled wrong. And we ran a, a uh, uh, local investigator out and started finding out more about the guy. The guy was doing renovations on his house. The renovations exceeded the value of his annual salary by an almost an order of magnitude. Um, so call me crazy, I'm thinking we're on to something here. Um, and the guy did not come from an independently wealthy family or anything like that. So that, that, that time stamping, melding all the data together, combining kind of your basic gumshoe investigative work with your technical results, on the tough cases, that's where you put it all together. Um, as a note, we're running um, about 80 to a, or so percent in terms of hard or soft kills on identifying the suspects and what happened. Um, that, uh, that'll probably beat the heck out of any major metropolitan homicide or um, a burglary unit. So that's a pretty good kill ratio, we think. Uh, we have not, as of yet, on any of these cases in the consulting side, had to testify in court. Uh, we have gotten to uh, deposition a couple of times. Uh, the opposing counsel, usually, if they've got somebody that's technically savvy, it's very, very easy because they understand, wow, this hurts. If they don't have somebody technically savvy, if you can get their eyes to stop rolling um, and you give them the printouts, that usually works as well. So we usually end up arrowing our clients into a fairly solid settlement on the civil litigation. Other than uh, finding the, the possible child pornography. We have not, on the consulting side, been involved in any traditional law enforcement prosecutions. I did enough of that in my prior background. Um, so it's a pretty good kill ratio, though. I think 80% is not too bad um, in terms of finding the suspect. Phase six, yeah, it's consulting. Nothing's ever done till the paper's done, you know? Um, Gets, gets to uh, combine all the data. Uh, we generally will burn our reports to CD and HTML, kind of normal way, link all the attachments in if we can do that. Uh, we'll customize it to work with the client's level of technical savvy. We have one client um, actually got kind of cranked off at us. He, uh, he paid about 80K for uh, us to do some work. Uh, we did a really good job, identified everything he needed. We sent him a four-page report, and he got very, very upset. He said, you know, I paid $80,000, and I got a four-page report. Hey, time out, Jim. That's the executive summary. The 26 CD-ROMs in the rest of the binder are actually the report. Everything's linked. You can just put those little things not in the floppy drive, the other drive. Um, that client we're actually doing another report for now. We're printing. We bought a new Phaser Tektronix color printer. We're laying it out and printing. Well, I mean, why, why make your client mad? If, if they're not comfortable with the technology, you've got to work with them. He's a phenomenal attorney, by the way. He's just not a technology guy. Um, so you work with him. Give it to him in whatever format they want to live with. Um, yeah. Brand new Tektronix Phaser 840 in the lab. Dropped in yesterday. I mean, it's doing. It's going to be doing print queue all weekend long. Hey, yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, for those folks that are uncomfortable with systems, we'll do simple pie charts with drive space analysis, deleted file analysis. That can get them pointed in the right direction. How many emails did we find? What are they? What do they look like? And try to make it to the level of the client. Um, Best to err on the side of caution and make no assumptions on their technical savvy. That will serve you in good stead when you deal with a jury. Um, because there you may deal with computer scientists, 
unlikely, but it's happened, I guess. Or you may deal with someone that has never used a PC or a system at home ever. Um, and trying to explain some of this esoteric stuff can be a little bit interesting. Uh, so make good charts. Lawyers love charts. Uh, graphs are good. Uh, try, to, try to basically put this massive amount of data into a digestible chunk. Uh, and correlate it with anything else the client is doing. If they have internal security looking at issues, if they have private investigators out there doing uh, traditional gumshoe work, check it out. Okay. Procedure stuff. Terminally dull. Hopefully uh, most of you got through it without sleeping, so that's a fairly good sign. Any questions on the procedure areas before I trollop off into the, uh, the uh, case study area? Let me re reiterate, please, that the case study stuff is fairly sensitive. I'm going to stay pretty sanitized. I think I've got four slides. I'll talk about six or seven other gigs. Um, but I would definitely prefer that you keep this fairly close hold. Thanks. All right. Oh, we talked about this one already. Um, denial of service. Yeah. When you're a big bank, a couple of trillion dollars worth of, net, of uh, value, and you're unable to do business, that is generally considered a bad thing. That uh, I kind of, oh boy, I was off on the plane there today. Use of non-traditional log analysis, yeah, frisking through access logs, basically, is what solved that case. Um, it's always interesting to us when we get in there to see why did this happen uh, from a system standpoint, from a protection standpoint, from a you don't want this to happen again. Um, number one, poor system controls. They let basically anybody that had technical knowledge access these mainframes. Um, the number of folks on a tandem, it's a super, super user that's root. Um, the number of folks that were super, super user was not much smaller than the set of folks that accessed the tandem. Um, so pretty bad stuff from a security standpoint. Limited network auditing is being kind. Um, Non-existent network auditing, uh, no use of firewalls inside the system, no use of any security appliance or device, no use of secure tokens, no use of a password that a three-year-old with a crayon couldn't crack. Um, pretty bad stuff in terms of security stuff. Not real rocket science to fix either. So that's kind of a scary thing. Was well, a foreign bank though, not a US bank. Um, guess that's a good sign. I don't know, we'll see after Y2K. Um, Another one that we just uh, we did, uh, manufacturing firm. This is where this was a great one. We got this call literally on Friday night. Um, had to go in on a Saturday, uh, late in the afternoon, early evening. We actually uh, we have T-shirts from a fictitious company that is a Y2K consulting company. I mean, there's nothing better to prove your bona fides than a company T-shirt. I mean, fake business cards in a company T-shirt or a company polo. Everybody thinks you're from a tech company, or it works like a charm. Um, give people what they want to hear. We actually ran into one lady that was working in the office uh, that night, and uh, so we had to stall for a while. So we just gave her the story, and you know, just laid it on about doing the Y2K assessment. Um, she was so into it, not really technically savvy, but she asked us to specifically review her system and see if anything would go funky on it. So we just kind of got in there, fiddled around on it, and made up a report in one page and said, "Dad, there were a couple of little issues with some DLLs in Windows, but." You know, other than that, you're out of there. We're making it up. Um, but as a cover story, it works phenomenally well. I'm figuring the Y2K issue is good for us getting in and out the door for about the next year and a half to two years. Um, I'm figuring it's golden. Then I'm going to have to come up with the pizza boy uniform again. Um, <laughs> that one works. Uh, I've been a flight attendant too. You know, depending on where you're going, you just you, your who is expected there. That's kind of fun though, uh, especially for the guys that I work with that haven't been agents that haven't done undercover work. It's like mini undercover work. It's a lot better than undercover work. Generally, these people don't have guns. They're not really mad at you. I mean, it's fun. Um, you get to kind of pretend you're somebody else. Um, for me, that's I generally pretend I'm somebody smarter than I really am, so that works out good. Delivery pizza worked out right about my level. Um, kind of fun, though. Uh, we imaged about 11 of the systems posing as IT consultants. Um, First five drives, we had the individual, guaranteed, lock, stock, and barrel, had them. This was kind of interesting. Um, uh, international manufacturing company that uh, had some slanderous, scandalous, and proprietary information posted to an industry rumor web page. Um, and they were, they were pretty, the slanderous, scandalous stuff, eh, okay, whatever, um, fine, and irritating, but fine. The company proprietary data on their strategy, uh, acquisition strategy, who they're going to buy, that stuff, you know, there's some SEC regulations about that. They were a little funny on that. They didn't really like that part. Uh, the fifth drive that we did, we found the guy that was pushing the stuff out. Um, the web page was actually in the UK, uh, worked out really nice. I called up one of my buddies that used to be Scotland Yard over there. He too is now an IT consultant. You're going to see this thing, this common theme. Security cops from the government to IT consultant. There's a no guns cash flow issue. It's much better. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, Mark went up there and had a chat with the guy, um, helped him understand some of the liability issues when dealing with a very large multinational conglomerate that has packs of attorneys that are like rabid wolves. Um, and you're a small person that publishes a web page that's publishing under the UK law, slanderous materials that you're not supposed to do. Um, so that kind of disappeared in a twinkling of an eye. I don't know if the site completely went down, but all the, all the junk went down real quick. Um, actually a really nice guy, just didn't realize how much of a hurt he could get himself in. He wasn't doing it maliciously, he was just posting the stuff that people sent him. Now the guy that sent the stuff, category one jerk, um, passed over for a promotion, thought he should be a VP of a certain area, um, was irritated, and took out his irritation by posting stuff out. Normal human behavior. Um, cost him his employment. Um, don't think they went with a full civil suit. Did the, we won't bring you to court if you keep your mouth shut thing. Um, and moved him off that way. This is um, where we say found several additional violations of company policy. Tons of porn. Um, probably all total about four or five gigs of porn out of the 11 drives. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, whatever you do in your spare time is your spare time, but how do you have that much time in the office to browse websites? And then B, do you realize that you are opening your company and possibly yourself up for some fairly heavy civil litigation if somebody gets upset or offended? And the probability of that is relatively high, given some of these images. Um, a couple of them actually, um, the, the Vice President of Human Resources was a woman, and uh, we went into the briefing with her and the attorneys and a couple of other folks, and we said, uh, this can be taken the wrong way, but we would like you to leave the room for this right now because I can guarantee uh, this stuff almost makes me puke and you're going to beat me up if I let you see this. Um, then we showed it to the attorneys. One turned white and one left the room. Um, really gross stuff. So, I mean, we're just not, we're not talking stuff from Playboy or um, whatever. Um, this was pretty nasty stuff. Um, so they definitely recouped the cost of the engagements. Um, one of the guys was like their lead sales guy that they had... Uh, um, he had taken a job somewhere else or something along those lines, but he was due a severance package. And it was like, I think we're talking like 100K in cash, and he was looking at out the door from stock and other stuff. But they had those riders in there. If your behavior can bring discredit upon our company, you're thumped. Well, they paid for the engagement out of him. Um, worked out fine. He's out of the deck, and uh, they got about 20K lift off the deal. So it worked out well from a profitability standpoint. Um, these guys' uh, vulnerabilities exploited. Um, uh, dual connectivity basically in all systems. Every system had an Ethernet card and every system had a modem um, generally operating uh, singly or in tandem. Everybody used their modems as their default connectivity route to the outside world um, because of perceived performance issues on the network. So uh, they just didn't want to deal with the firewall so they went ahead and dialed up MindSpring AOL, pick your internet service provider of choice and shoved it out that way. Um, not a good thing from a security standpoint, I understand. Uh, call me crazy. I think they're working on that uh, at this company. I think they've actually installed some internal walls too. Um, we taught them that a good modem is a modem that meets a sledgehammer. Um, it's a really, seriously, from uh, the proactive side of the house, the, the proactive side of the company that does security assessments or penetration tests, a lot of financial institutions will pay us. They're, these are the guys I like, they're smart. They're like, hey, can you break into our network? Well, the answer is yes, it's just a question of how much time give you a good example of why modems are evil. Um, top 10-ish bank in the U.S. engaged us to assess their security. We flew a team of four folks out to the area of their regional headquarters, spooled up eight notebooks running basically a war dialer because we had done our homework and knew the phone numbers, uh, at least the extensions and prefixes, banged away on their network for about six hours. At the end of six hours, they had identified like 400 modems that not, not just picked up, but were running PC anywhere. And like 120 of them, they just kind of started testing them, had no passwords. One of them allowed them access, so within six hours, they had super user on uh, the primary uh, transaction server. So that's not too bad in terms of hacking your way into a bank. We only got paid like about 50K for that, so you know, that's, we could have gotten paid a lot more if we weren't honest. Um, that actually worked out real well. A, modems are evil. The company knows that. They take modems out and introduce them to the parking lot. Um, that's a good thing, except for the road warriors, and then they're tightly controlled on the notebooks. B, the person that engaged us inside that bank, his whole point when doing a penetration test is, hey, something really can happen. This is not just stuff you see in the Washington Post. It can actually hurt you in pretty quickly. Well, he's funded now. They've got a cert. 
They've got an incident response team. We've helped them develop some forensics procedures. They're doing employee awareness. They're doing regular systems audits, hardcore penetration tests and vulnerability scans. They're using, I think, a smart move, bad from a business standpoint for us, but smart for them. Um, and I actually kind of endorse it, is they're using a multiple uh, level of vendors. Uh, they'll use us quite a lot, but they'll use somebody else as a cross check on procedures, techniques, methodology, and they do I guess the polite term is knowledge transfer or brain suck. Um, the penetration test, their lead guy, their lead security guy from the IT side of the house sat with our team during the whole two week exercise. Um, after the first six hours he was rather depressed, but um, just sat in there to glean as much as he possibly could off the procedures and stuff. So long winded story, but modems are bad um, is the bottom line of that. Are you seeing similar badnesses with portable devices like laptops and stuff taking the data and just walking out? Yeah. Get by the firewall? Yeah. Um, physical access. I mean, forensics is based on physical access. So, yeah, if you're going to do a job and do it right, walk it out the front door um, as opposed to shoving it over the network. The evidence, A, the, the possibility of being caught is much, much lower if you just disappear the drive. Um, now, it's a little bit more obvious if somebody does wake up and smell the coffee. We had um, a consulting house uh, that we did the engagement for. It's kind of scary. We consult the consulting houses uh, that they lost seven people that started their own new consulting firm um, and walked the methodology and some tool sets out the door. Well, God bless them. One of the guys thought formatting his drive was enough. Um, who ah, <laughs> gotta love it. Uh, the other guys were pretty good. Two of them uh, used some secure wipe technologies, uh, made our life difficult. But they, you know, you're only as good as the weakest team member in this conspiracy. And the weak guy gave them away. They got nailed in a civil settlement. They just got drilled. I don't think they're in business. Um, so yeah, that is the right answer. I mean, if I was going to lift a bank, other than modem dial because somebody can, can get some number identification off that. But if you're in a hotel, who cares? Uh, if you're a hotel in Brussels, who really cares? Um, yeah, physical access. Um, just masquerade into the company and lift what you can by hand is a good answer. Misuse of network. Um, uh, this is another gig, another manufacturing firm. Uh, same kind of thing. Um, we had run into helping out with some problems that I am not allowed to talk about. Um, same kind of thing. Uh, sexually explicit images. Uh, the one thing that's nice about browsing is that it leaves just such great stuff in free space and in slack space in terms of history, uh, like what you were looking for. The, uh, the guy I interviewed in this situation afterwards just sat there with the attorney, HR director, and myself, and uh, he said he got the files mailed to him from a buddy and he immediately deleted him. We went over the history of deletions. Well, why are some kept in good directories and some kept in cool directories? And he had some other stupid name for directories on where he saved pics. Um, and then I'm not real familiar with Yahoo, but these teen sex pics search strings that you're doing for and all the hits from it, I'm thinking that's probably more than somebody sending you an email. Call me crazy. Um, so yeah, cache file, slack space, that gives you great indicators of how they're doing whatever they're doing. Uh, good things to look for. Also good things if you're trying to hide something to flush your cache and burn your hard drive. Um, the only good hard drive from a, from a forensic standpoint that you can't get at is one that is melted, toasted, beat up, fried, whatever. So go hard. Uh, I threw an obligatory slide from my government days in there. Um, I'll talk about Rome Labs too if anybody's interested, but that's such old dead news. I don't know if you guys have heard that to death or not. Um, Gunner Air Force Base got, got whacked pretty hard too. It's a little technical station outside of Montgomery, Alabama that the Air Force runs. It's a great target of opportunity for hackers because there's an organization called the Standard Systems Group there. And uh, it develops standard things for the Air Force, for computers. Good hacking target. Um, the attacks came in, the Air Force and its CERT developed, uh, actually we, we developed for them a product called ASIM, which is essentially a network intrusion detection system. It's been up and running since about 92, um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day on every Air Force base worldwide. Well, the ASIM deployment team went out, I guess it was about 93, they were finishing the installs, um, dropped the ASIM box onto the primary internet connectivity gateway and got it up and running, configured it, fiddled with it. It's a sunbox, they played with it for about a week got back home to Kelly Air Force Base in Texas, one of the engineers, my kind of guy, paranoid, decides, now nah, let's just check the logs, see what's going on. You know, I got like a spare hour between football games, let's see what's shaking. Bang, zoom, malice, somebody straight over that in his route, um, just moving right in, uh, coming from an educational facility. Indicators are that's not the right answer. Um, probably not. Got in there. We flew out actually a team uh, working with NASA, the FBI, uh, 
Army's Criminal Investigations Command and about uh, half a dozen to a dozen OSI agents. Flew them out, got to the initial site, did all the gathering, got to the initial connectivity point backwards. It was an educational facility. Um, got some help from them, got the appropriate subpoena type paperwork to so that they could provide us the help and not get hit in the court. Uh, identified the next link in the chain. Got to the next link in the chain and it was not a university you play football against but a fairly well-known national university. Um, got in there and we ran into the, the dream from a law enforcement traceback standpoint. Hacked accounts. There were stolen accounts. Well, that's easy because then you don't have to deal with wiretap issues or subpoenas or anything like that. You go ask the person, hey, your account, did you realize it's being used to commit a felony? No, I, I just read email once in a while. Cool. Do you mind if we like follow everything that happens in your account with your consent? Consent is the best thing. If you've got a person in a situation like that, you don't have to deal with a wiretap because somebody's stolen their stuff and is using it. It's great. That gave us the trace back um, to a mid-sized internet service provider in eastern Tennessee. Uh, set up a meeting. Uh, the actual, the, the primary case agent, Karen Matthews, phenomenal. Uh, just, just bulldog work on this case. I mean, six weeks worth of 24 by 7 monitoring. Uh, got to the ISP, sat down and talked with the owners. Um, actually, was scheduling the meeting. Hey, um, I'm from the Air Force. We got a little problem. We got some issues with security and computers and stuff like that. Uh, we think somebody's using you to hack into us. He goes, you know, that's kind of weird. So I got a meeting tomorrow with a guy that says he's a computer security consultant to talk about the state of my network security. I've never heard of him before he's some local kid. Um, hey, bugging the lamp trick works really, really well. Bug the lamp, a uh, guy comes in, gives this great spiel. Actually, I've stolen some of it for some of my sales pitches. Hey, you know, I am, of course, anybody that hacks is one of the 10 best hackers in the universe. He was one of the 10 best hackers in the universe, of course. Um, yeah, he's mid-range, bottom third, probably, in reality. Um, but he uses his powers for good, not evil. These are good Jedi mind tricks. Um, <laughs> He wants to help the guy. Yeah, he owns root on his system. Yeah, he broke it out of a shell account. Yeah, that's maybe bad, but he's there for three to five hundred dollars an hour, which is a good rate, and we don't get that. Um, he's going to defend him from every other hacker on the planet. Funny, a lot of judges view that as extortion. And this one did. Um, so that was great. Not only did we go from an electronic realm on identifying the hacker, now we've got Candid Snaps, a great recording that made the judge laugh and the prosecutor laugh. Uh, we got his car tag. Um, we laughed. We laughed a lot. Um, we really laughed a lot. It was funny. Um, we got his car tag, home address, all that kind of stuff. Got working with the internet service provider, yeah, we think this is probably our guy, but there's a lot of activity, like a lot more than one person could be doing, there's got to be more. Uh, got permission to do some uh, wiretaps, did some dial number recording to identify uh, the numbers that were dialing into the pop associated with certain transactions, flipped that backwards and came up with the real numbers, found out there were cell phones, started to have major freak attack, panic big time, figuring, okay, Maybe this guy is working with the likes of Kevin Mitnick and we're into some serious mojo here. This could be kind of fun. Um, there is a way to trace cellular stuff. Um, it gets a lot harder if somebody's burning their cell phone with a new number and a new electronic serial number every time they use it, like Mitnick would. Um, but it is possible to track normal cell phones. These guys were not that much of rocket scientists. Uh, basically, to dial this ISP, they were out of their local calling zone for their landline. So what they did, it had free long distance dialing on their cell phones on the weekends. Use the cell phone as a switch, pop it on over. Um, just forward the call right on over. Great stuff in terms of investigative lead. Now we've got their social security numbers, their credit reports. we got everything about them. Uh, turns out three primary suspects, all in their mid-20s. Um, one of them was a really nice guy, just uh, kind of doing stupid stuff. One was a category one jerk, um, the guy that was the white hat, black hat guy. Uh, he repaired PCs at a small shop in the local area, 10 best hackers on the planet. Um, we did about a week's worth of simultaneous electronic and physical surveillance on them so that this was kind of in the early days of doing these cases. We wanted to do a little overkill, so telephoto lens in the van, picture of guy at, at bedroom, you know, lights came on at X time, hacked at this time, clickety, 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 click. Um, uh, intrusion detection stuff's going off left and right, pile all those logs together. And then at about 6 in the morning on a Friday, we, uh, we did the uh, federal search warrant visit thing. I got to do uh, White Hat, Black Hat, my good friend Eddie Koo. Um, he wasn't home. I was totally bummed. Um, went in with a bureau agent and my favorite trick, a really, really large sheriff or deputy. Like a good door opening kind of guy. Um, you know, I'm kind of small. Big guy get the bullet. Jim stay in the back, run away. Um, worked out fine. Nobody home. We're pounding on the door. Well, this this my theory backfired in this case. Um, they were like, damn, the FBI guy, you know, FBI monster, just 
giant, physically huge man. Uh, great, brilliant guy, but huge. They're, they're like, damn, we gotta break into this place. We really don't wanna beat the house up too much. I mean, we can get the ram, but then we're gonna sweat, and there's gonna be a happy face on the door and all that kind of stuff. Um, let's go around the back. We go around the back, and we find a window that's about half a story up that was open. So they pry that up without even warning me. They just picked me up and chucked me in the window. <laughs> <laughs> I hear this comment about, hey, Air Force, fly. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I did a good combat roll, came out with a gun, the whole thing. Yeah, I, I fell. Um, <laughs> stereotypical hacker haven, though. This, um, for those of you that hack on a casual regard um, and do it to systems that you're allowed to, that's great. Um, for those of you that are doing it to systems you don't own, somebody's going to visit you probably. Um, bad thing. This guy fit the behavior pattern almost to a T of the stereotype of a criminal hacker. It was funky. Like, you want one of those rascal biological suits to go in there, the whole deal. Um, go into the place, and, and the bedroom was basically a semi-recognizable futon with a sort of disassembled Mac 2E, um, and like some used Twinkies, a pizza carton, and what appeared to be elements of clothing. Um, scary. You get into most of the rooms in the house, and it was just gross like that. And then you got to where the guy hacked. It was freaky. This guy's definitely kind of an uh, interesting split personality could have been a military academy cadet's desk. The monitor was precisely lined up at 45 degree angle, laid right on the angle of the desk. A keyboard was squared off right in front of it. Mouse pad, everything dusted perfectly. Notepad laid out nice here, flipped open, pencil beside it. I mean, just bizarre compulsive behavior. Really liked it. Um, the best part, in addition to his hard drive with all the evidence and that kind of stuff, uh, the best part was this stack of floppy disks right beside it. Now, I'm not a real rocket scientist, but as an agent, I learned a couple of things. What looks different in the picture? Let's go to the neat stuff. Let the FBI guy handle the funky stuff. You know, you get the underwear, man. That's your job. Um, I'm the computer guy. These are floppies. I like it. Stacked up, the very top one said various mill site password files. And I'm like, this is groovy. It's groovy because there are two primary laws that are used to prosecute uh, intrusion cases. The first one is the hacking statute, section uh, 1030 of Title 18. That basically says you go into somebody's box that you're not supposed to, and if it's A, a government box, or B, a box that's used in interstate commerce, i.e. if it's connected to the net, um, that's a bad thing. Uh, depending on how bad you were, how bad it is from misdemeanor to felony. The other one's even better though, section 1029. It's based on the fact that uh, people have credit cards and calling cards and they have a PIN associated with it. And then if you purloin 11 accounts and PIN pairs, i.e. system accounts and passwords, then that is a bad thing at the felony level, at the federal level. Now, I'm not crazy, stack of floppy disks, all full of password files from sites. It's like, okay, we're looking at a couple of hundred felonies here. Groovy, five years of pop. This guy's staying in jail till he dies. Um, so that was easy proof on the case too. Notepad was great too. Notes on how he's getting into systems, where he was using for reference points for data on systems he didn't understand. Uh, really, really good stuff. Bizarre, uh, out of the three, uh, he actually had some element of an external life. He had a girlfriend. He was visiting his girlfriend at the time in Atlanta when we popped his house. Apparently he was interviewing with a large consulting firm to be a computer security consultant. I understand he is no longer in the computer security field. Um, he got drilled for, I think they pled him out on about 15 or 20 of the felonies, uh, clipped him to jail time, told him you'll do uh, probation for five or 10. Um, if you're stupid on post during that time, we'll hurt you. And uh, I think they hit him with like 50 or $60,000 worth of damages and recoveries. Um, some of which the internet service provider got back for loss and damages. So worked out pretty well from an investigative standpoint. The reason I threw that in there is the other ones I was talking about are straight forensics gigs, get in and get the system. This is network trace back in the law enforcement style, non-technical style. Um, provides you a little bit of a difference on how these things kind of work. Kind of fun. Um, afterwards, offline, if you want, I can tell you a couple of more case studies. I've been long-winded. Um, I'll burn through the Linux tool development. Uh, it's kind of interesting, I think. Um, John and Nick, our two primary uh, commercial side senior forensics examiners, have been uh, have been irritated at the state of tool development for computer forensics lately. Um, depending on what operating system they're working with, what they're doing, they have to deal with different tool sets, different procedures, different methodology. It just bugs them. Besides, they're kind of open source code kind of guys anyways. It's just their nature. Um, so they want a standard forensics toolkit that they can use in a majority of the situations. Um, they want to work with as much hardware as is possible to deal with. Uh, they want to cut image size automatically in chunks that will fit on a CD-ROM or later onto a DVD. Um, they want to, because I ride their butt, 
be happy and make the client happy and give them results as fast as we possibly can that are technically and, and investigatively accurate. Uh, and they want to meet current evidentiary requirements. And you love this part. I mean, we are a company, simple to operate and low cost. You know, if the forensics processing station, uh, like some stuff out of the UK, costs $250,000, you've got to do a lot of work to pay for that Hummer. And maybe there's a cheaper way to do it. We think they've found a way. Um, they're in early beta right now on this. Um, basically, Linux is the answer. Um, if the Red Hat stock didn't prove that, I don't know what did. Okay, and that's my only Microsoft toss. Um, basically what they're doing is they're building a Linux boot disk that supports um, an Ethernet card and basically a crossover Ethernet cable off the back side of the system, supports the parallel port, boots the system in a controlled environment. We're designing it right now for Intel architecture machines. They will get their way down the rest of the world, um, but the majority of the stuff that we see is an Intel-based box. Um, do not mount anything in the system. Basically, it, uh, it pops up. Um, no, advantages, raw device level, native in Linux. You can do it with almost anything. And if you can't do it today, somebody will write a driver somewhere tomorrow. And if you ask, you might even get it for free. Um, and a lot of technical support, both within our company. We've got a couple of guys in the firm, um, mainly on the penetration side, that run or moderate some fairly uh, significant Linux areas. Um, so there's a lot of Linux guys in the company. So we've got a lot of support for it. Um, Hardware-wise, like I said, boot floppy for the target system. Crossover Ethernet cable. Okay, we're up to about 20 cents now on equipment costs. Um, notebook running Linux to control the process. If you're cheap, you can do that for a grand. Um, if you want to watch a DVD on the flight and boot to your 98 drive, then it's about three grand. Um, whatever. Um, so still, uh, three, four grand compared to $250,000. We're looking at a cost-efficient method of doing processing. Process and everything. If it, if it weren't technically competent, we wouldn't use it. But I think the guys have got it. Um, Boots the target system does not mount any drives at all whatsoever. So you ain't writing to them. And that's a good thing. Because if you write to the evidence, that's a bad thing. Uh, searches for an Ethernet card, connects to the notebook. Uh, if it doesn't find it, terminates. Um, basically grabs system info on the way in. Uh, and then conducts basically a raw churn of the media that's in the system and pushes that right back out the crossover cable, chunks it out. Um, I'm going to go with that 620 megs just because it seemed like a nice round number under the CD-ROM barrier. It just felt good, warm, and fuzzy. It's easy to add. Um, right now, as the beta is going, it does inline keyword searching. We like the keyword list to be about six to seven max. Uh, they're doing some stuff with the buffers to make it a bigger keyword list. But this is really key because those phases that I talked about earlier, we're now compressing phase one and phase two into the same thing. And we'll have our raw results for the client on the way out the door. That's a good thing. Um, that's going to beat the pants off our competition, who's going to give them a report in three to four months. Um, those normal evidence preservation stuff, performance checksums and all of that. Modifications right now, since uh, we see about 40% of the drives that we run into have issues with graphic images, um, we're going to build inline reconstruction of graphic images right into it. So we don't even have to play that game anymore. We're just going to dump it right off onto the hard drive. Uh, we'll probably get into serious internal company uh, busting this fall. Um, it's one thing we've got a lot of folks is that folks that like to break code uh, before we put it out. Right now we haven't firmed this up as a business plan um, and we haven't asked the uh, the president of the company, how he wants to go about it, but I'm fairly sure he'll do what we ask, and that's for sure um, free distribution to law enforcement community. When I say that, uh, translate that into nonprofit environment, um, educational environment too. Um, we're debating whether or not we want to release it for use into the commercial market space or not. It's a pretty good advantage over our competitors, in all honesty. Why give them a leg up? Um, so we're debating that. The open tool set kind of thing versus should we train the competition? Um, so we'll see how that goes. We probably will provide it with no support originally. And this is primarily geared towards law enforcement. Um, if demand requ requires, we'll develop um, training that, that folks can pay us to go to, and then they'll get support out of it. Uh, the goal is to make it cop proof. Um, that means, you know, floppy disk, bright logo, A and B on the connector so everybody gets it right. Notebook that does one thing and one thing only, this. Um, and then terminate simply with a big error message saying call somebody in your organization that knows what's going on um, if it doesn't find something. So having been a cop, I can say it should pass the sticky donut finger test, um, hopefully. That's about it. Ran through kind of where we're going. Hopefully gave you some good stories on uh, what we've run into along the way. If you've got any questions, I zipped through that in uh, just a little bit over the required time. Shoot, sir. All right.
are you handling the uh, data storage issues for things like well, multiple 20 gig hard drives in an in a office environment on a single laptop? Lots and lots of drives in the office right now. Um, they are going to um, a fairly big drive array is what they're going to do. Um, but generally, because of data segregation issues when we're working on them, we will actually go out and buy like or similar drives. Uh, it's just a cost of doing the business. But for the actual uh, processing? That's processing, I can understand. Okay. The collection issues where you have multiple 20 gig hard drives yep. that you're not able to take back to the lab with you. Um, we will do those on site. Um, and we'll shove them off. We'll either bring drives to clone them off to, um, or we will buy drives, depending on how much we're dealing with. I think the biggest one that we did was those 11 systems, and the drive space in there topped out at about 6 gigs a piece on the big drives. No multiple hard drives on those. A couple of the others have been standalone servers that had, one had 220s, so we just brought a couple with us. Um, that's the way we're working it right now. It's not necessarily the perfect answer, but it's a simple answer. Um, we, um, we debated there for a while with our clients reusing drives, and basically our procedure is we buy new drives, uh, we test them and check them when we get them, um, we put them on the shelf for the client when we go do the engagement, um, and then we give the client the drive after we've fragged it. That way we don't really have an issue with, with data crossing. Um, if somebody gets, you know, somebody finds a bug in one of the commercially available tools that we're using right now, well, we're fairly sure this way it's going to be real, real hard to have results from one case interfere with results from another case. <laughs> Anything else? Shoot. Do you, have, uh, you have like a real technical savvy person you're investigating and I don't know, they, they start writing their own encryption. Yeah, um, breaking encryption is uh, we are not as well healed or well empowered as NSA. We do not have any Cray computers. Um, brute forcing encryption is not going to happen for us. However, people the thing that gets us by in a situation, because we've done it once, and it wasn't uh, uh, their own encryption, it was a commercial product, but there were no known workarounds for the product, and the company that made it obviously said there weren't. Um, what we rely on then is basically human behavior. Uh, did he leave himself any notes anywhere? Um, this guy left a little bit of hints uh, in his outlook that went to his Palm Pilot. And the other part was um, when he was developing or installing some of the documents, before he encrypted some of the important documents, uh, they had been stored as temp files and then deleted by the operating system, so they were in Slack. So the data was in Slack space. So going up brute force against encryption is not an idea I relish to any stretch of the imagination. Operating system and user behavior are going to allow us angles to get at the data. Um, that's basically you do a workaround. Have you found much cases where they use stenography, where they hide stuff like Stego? That? Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I haven't found it in any cases. I've got uh, a couple of different Stego tools. As a matter of fact, uh, when, I, when I talk to folks about that, I use a picture of my two-year-old daughter, uh, and I embed her resume in there, um, just as demonstration purposes. Other than one hacker case where folks were, um, scratch that, it was a wares case that I did while I was with the government, uh, not a little bit different than a normal ego hack case. Um, and folks who are embedding the URL of the where site into a button on their web page. That's kind of cool. Um, that, that's, I like that from an elegant standpoint. Simple, discreet, easy to find. Uh, they didn't encrypt it. Um, but a lot of the steganography now embeds encryption uh, right into the product and some fairly solid you know, uh, encryption algorithms. If we run into that, um, the same thing. You've got to evaluate who you're working against. If you're working against the best Linux guy that they've got in the opposition company, you'd better have as good, if not a lot better folks able to work against them to give you pointers from an investigative side uh, on how to process and what to look for. And then look for any freebie you can get your hands on. Um, talk to people. If all else fails, look for a human interface. Um, that sometimes can give you some valuable information. But yeah, I haven't seen a lot of Stego other than a lot of talk about how cool it is in the one where site case. I have not personally run into it a whole lot, although I like it from a personal privacy kind of standpoint. It's cool. Shoot. You mentioned that the analysis in the later phases is very um, labor intensive. Do you use any tools such as data mining, or are you developing any, anything? We're looking at that. Um, none of us are super hot on the data mining tools themselves. Um, We've gotten to the point now where we probably only have to go that far in about 40 to 50 percent of the cases before we find it, but we've reached a level of volume where we're going to have to do something smarter in that regard. Um, I'm sure John and Nick have some rough ideas on it, but uh, I don't think they've gone down the path of tool selection and testing yet, but uh, they will have to because there are only a finite number of hours 
that we have, and there are only a finite number of folks we can hire that are experienced in this. So that was a pretty wishy-washy answer. Sorry about that. Short answer: No, not yet, but we will. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. If you've got any questions offline, please feel free. Uh, it was a pleasure. Have a good weekend.